Corey began arguing with the man about the way that he was talking to someone else. I got a phone call about two o'clock in the morning from my mom saying that there was police at the house. Investigators didn't have much information to share. At that time, I knew something really, really bad was happening. You can't just sit there and do nothing. So I went out and did my little investigation. Corey Day Desmond was born on March 18, 1980, in Torrance, Los Angeles County. The oldest child in the family, Corey faced major health challenges from birth as she was born with a hole in her diaphragm. She underwent several surgical procedures even before she could walk, and doctors gave her only a 20% chance of surviving to adulthood. Fortunately, Corey made it through these difficult early years and grew up to be a healthy and happy young woman. Corey was an honor student in high school and earned a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from California State University in Long Beach. At around this time, she moved into her grandmother's house, though she maintained connections with her family, particularly with her father, Mark. Not long after earning her degree, however, Corey decided that she wasn't comfortable handling guns, so she abandoned her plans of becoming a law enforcement officer. She then explored many different career paths and briefly considered becoming a substitute teacher and a chef. While trying to figure out what career to pursue, Corey started working as a waitress and bartender at the many bars along Redondo Beach in South Bay, Los Angeles. She was perfectly suited to this line of work, given her charm, friendliness, and outgoing personality. Aside from having an angelic smile and contagious laughter, Corey was also a down-to-earth and no-nonsense person who could easily handle a room full of rowdy customers. After a few years working in the bars, Corey had become one of the most recognizable and well-loved personalities on the strip. She was always the center of attention, whether tending bar or belting out a song during karaoke nights. But one February night in 2009, Corey became the target of a brutal and vicious crime that sent shockwaves throughout the entire community. On February 13, 2009, she spent the night at her friend, Brittany Carafa's house, after a night out on the town. Corey left Brittany's house early the next day and reported to work at the Beaches Bar and Restaurant in Manhattan Beach later that day. After her shift at 9 p.m., Corey visited a few bars in the Redondo Beach area. She eventually ended up at the BX Street Lounge on Artesia Boulevard and Phelan Lane shortly past midnight. Corey used to work at the bar and still had many friends there, so she spent the next couple of hours tending the bar. At one point during the evening, Corey exchanged heated words with a bar patron over how he treated another customer. The man left the bar shortly after the argument, while Corey stayed to help her friends clean up until the bar closed at around 2 a.m. Corey left the BAC Street Lounge at around 2.20 a.m., exiting through the back door. A surveillance camera outside the bar showed that she walked through the parking lot and headed north on Phelan Lane toward Artesia Boulevard. Corey's Jeep Wrangler was parked along Mackay Lane, which was south of Artesia Boulevard and one block west of BC Street Lounge. But instead of going toward her Jeep, she passed Mackay Lane kept walking west toward Bogey's Sports Bar. A camera outside the South Bay Credit Union recorded her walking past at 2.26 a.m. Her friend, Brittany, was working at Bogey's Sports Bar that evening, though she had already left by the time Corey arrived at around 2.30 a.m. Corey had also previously worked at Bogey's and was a frequent customer, so when she banged on the door, asking to use the bathroom, the owner, Frank Kanko, didn't think anything was out of the ordinary. However, state laws prohibited bars from opening their doors to customers past 2 a.m., so Frank couldn't let her in. It was obvious that Corey had been drinking, but she didn't seem to be in any kind of danger, so he turned her away. This was the last sighting of Corey before she disappeared. This is the last time we could actually see Corey Desmond alive before we lost her. It killed me, because then I started doing all the we shoulda, coulda, wouldas. If I would've stayed five minutes longer, thinking that I could've done something. On Monday, February 16th, 2009, a motorist named Tim Baker was driving along Highway 330 when he stopped by mile marker 38 near Running Springs to remove the tire chains from his car. When he looked down the embankment, he spotted a large garbage bag with legs protruding from it. Tim immediately called the California Highway Patrol and reported his discovery. Officers quickly arrived on the scene and confirmed that the garbage bag contained a human body. They subsequently called the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department, which initiated a homicide investigation. The way that the trash bag was on her, indicated that she was transported to that location and placed there. We saw tire tracks when we first got there and they were gone within minutes. After performing a routine fingerprint check, forensics experts confirmed that the body was Corey Desmond. They also visually matched the deceased with the driver's license photo found on the scene. She still had on the same clothes she was wearing when she was last seen early Sunday morning, although her pants had been pulled down while her purse and shoes were missing. Upon learning of his daughter's demise, Corey's father, Mark, was understandably grief-stricken. 
Still, he refused to simply wait for the police's investigation of Corey's demise, so he decided to conduct his own efforts to uncover what happened to his daughter. Mark retraced his daughter's steps on that fateful evening, going from bar to bar and questioning anyone who might have seen her. On February 17, 2009, he found her Jeep on McKay Lane right where she had left it, with the doors locked and the windows rolled up. Corey's car was found parked on a quiet side street not far from several bars she liked to go to after work. The fact that he found her Jeep in Redondo Beach really allowed us to lock target on a certain area. Police summoned to the scene did not find any clue as to what happened to Corey, but the abandoned state of the vehicle led them to believe that she was killed sometime in the early morning hours of February 15th. An autopsy conducted on Corey's body revealed that she succumbed to asphyxia caused by a combination of strangulation and suffocation. The autopsy also revealed extensive bruising on Corey's face and head. The examiner believed that these injuries occurred while she was still alive. She also had multiple abrasions on her legs, suggesting that she was dragged over a rough surface after she had perished. Unfortunately, the medical examiner wasn't able to obtain fingerprints or foreign DNA from Corey's body. Without any solid leads, the police turned their attention to the one person who may have had reason to harm Corey, the man she had argued with at the BAT Street Lounge. The man was easy to find as he lived just across the street from the bar. When questioned, he admitted having gotten into a heated argument with Corey, but he denied having anything to do with her demise. The man agreed to a polygraph test and allowed investigators to conduct a thorough search of his home and vehicle. Ultimately, they didn't find anything to tie him to Corey's disappearance, and his alibi after he left the bar checked out as well. At this point, the police weren't any closer to solving the mystery. As the case started going cold, Mark Desmond had three billboards put up along Redondo Beach, asking the public for any information that would lead to the culprit's arrest. He also paid to have 50 electronic billboards in Southern California display information about the crime. Finally, in May 2009, the police got a break in the case. An anonymous phoned-in tip came in from someone who saw one of the billboards Mark put up. The unknown female caller told police that someone named Perez had scrubbed and cleaned his vehicle's interior in the days after Corey's disappearance, but the caller didn't provide any more details. Even though the police had a last name, they didn't have much else to go on as there were thousands of people named Perez in the area. Fortunately, they got another break on August 12, 2009, when they received another call about Perez. This time, the person on the other end of the line identified herself as Tiffany Ware. Tiffany was in a relationship with a man named Tony Lopez Perez, with whom she had a son. Her account of Perez's activities on the night Corey Desmond disappeared, and in the days immediately afterwards strongly convinced police that this was the person responsible for the crime. Tony Perez was a longtime South Bay resident. He lived with Tiffany Ware and their son on Carnegie Lane, only a few blocks from where the victim was last seen. In fact, one of the billboards Corey's father put up was easily visible from their home. His girlfriend, Tiffany, wasn't initially aware of Perez's involvement in the crime, but his actions aroused her suspicions. Perez had gone out to celebrate Valentine's Day with his family at the restaurant he worked at on February 14, 2009, leaving Tiffany and his son at home. They spoke on the phone at about 11 p.m., at which time Perez said that he would be home shortly. However, Tiffany woke up the next day, February 15th at 2 a.m., to find that Perez still hadn't returned. She called the restaurant and his cell phone repeatedly, but was not able to reach him. Perez finally got home at about 4.30 a.m., claiming to have been at the restaurant with his brother all night. Though Tiffany was suspicious of this, she didn't pursue the matter. Later that morning, Perez went to work and was out all day. He usually came home between 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., but this time he didn't return until about 9 p.m. Perez was at home for only an hour before announcing that he was going out again, this time to visit his mother. He returned home at about 2 a.m. the following day. The next day was Perez's day off from work. He had purchased some cleaning products, telling Tiffany that he was going to clean his Dodge Durango after he vomited in it the previous Saturday night. This raised Tiffany's suspicions further, as Perez had never cleaned his car before. She also thought it was unusual for him to have waited so long to do the cleaning, considering how concerned he seemed to be about the supposed mess. The man even took his car to an auto detailing service the following Tuesday, and although he initially told her that he had spent all Saturday night drinking at the bar with his brother, he started telling Tiffany that he had apparently fallen asleep in their driveway and had been there the entire time. Weeks later, Perez suggested a drive up to Big Bear to see the snow-capped peaks. Again, this struck Tiffany as unusual, because they had never taken such a trip before. As they passed the spot along Highway 330 where Corey's body was found, Perez pointed out the location to her. At one point, Perez actually stopped and 
pointed out a location and asked Tiffany if she wondered if that was the location that the girl was dumped at, specifically meaning Corey Desmond. Perez exhibited even more strange behavior in the days afterward. He suddenly traded in his Durango for a Ford excursion, even though they only had a few payments left to make and were looking forward to paying it off. He also changed his cell phone without explanation. But it was a chilling statement from Perez that convinced Tiffany to report her suspicions. They had casually been discussing what happened to Corey Desmond one day when he blurted out that he hoped that the police didn't suspect him of the crime. On October 8, 2009, two detectives from the sheriff's department interviewed Tony Perez at his home, saying they were merely conducting a routine canvas of the neighborhood. Perez was calm and cooperative saying that he knew nothing about Corey Desmond's disappearance. What he didn't know at the time was that detectives had already tracked down his old Dodge Durango and had found traces of Corey's blood in the vehicle. But because Perez's DNA wasn't found on Corey's body, they needed more physical evidence to connect him to the crime. To the detective's surprise, Perez offered to come to the police station for further questioning. There, he first claimed that he never saw Corey Desmond, but later changed his story, saying that he might have seen her outside Bogey's bar and possibly even whistled at her. He went on to change his story a few more times, initially claiming that he passed by Bogey's and then headed to his apartment at around 1.30 a.m., where he fell asleep in his car. But after further questioning, he changed his story again, claiming that he did see Corey lying unconscious on a driveway near his car and tried to revive her by shaking her. When he failed to get a response, Perez allegedly panicked, realizing that the woman was dead. He told investigators that, in his drunken state, he put her in the back seat of his car and drove home, where he promptly fell asleep. I panicked and that's when I put her in my car. Eventually, he actually admits to physically contacting Corey Desmond. Perez continued his account by saying that he woke up the next morning to find her body still in his vehicle. And so he wrapped Corey up in trash bags and drove to Highway 330, where he flung her off a ravine. When asked why he didn't call for help when he found Corey, Perez claimed that he was afraid that he would be accused of killing her. No innocent person puts a body in the back of your vehicle, goes back to sleep in your apartment, goes to work. Unconvinced, detectives pressed the suspect further. Ultimately, they uncovered that many of Perez's strange actions reported by Tiffany Ware were his attempts to conceal his involvement in the crime. This included coming home late after work on Sunday, during which time he had wrapped Corey up in garbage bags. His supposed visit to his mother was also an excuse to find time to dispose of her body. During the investigation, Perez willingly reenacted how he supposedly found Corey and how he threw her off the ravine. He also admitted for the first time that he might have applied pressure on the victim's neck for several seconds, at which time he heard her expel some air. This chilling statement, along with the reenactments, gave detectives enough reason to arrest Tony Perez on October 8, 2009, on suspicion of murder. It just hit me like a brick, was when the officer came over and said that Tony has admitted to having some involvement with the murder of Corey. Perez's trial began on July 19, 2011, because he admitted to pressing down on Corey's neck and subsequently dumping her body. His defense hinged on whether he had willingly committed murder his defense attorney claimed that there was no premeditation on his client's part and that his actions stemmed from intoxicated fear rather than malice. But the prosecution insisted that Perez's actions were criminally motivated. They suggested that he had purposely stalked Corey and attempted to take advantage of her. When she resisted, Perez took her life. This was strengthened when his girlfriend, Tiffany Ware, testified in court about two occasions in which Perez violated her, happening while she was asleep after taking pain medications. She also claimed that he had become increasingly aggressive in the months leading up to the incident, describing him as having an insatiable appetite, despite them having intimacy nearly every day. With these, the jury found Perez's actions willful, deliberate, and premeditated. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Tony Perez, guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. They subsequently convicted him on one count of first degree murder, and the court sentenced him to a state prison term of 25 years to life. Corey Desmond's life was cut short by a vicious criminal who had no control over his impulses. His reprehensible actions not only caused sorrow and pain to Corey's family, but condemned his own child to a life without a father. On February 18, 2009, three days after her tragic end, a candlelight vigil was held to pay respects to Corey. Corey's closest friends and family members also hosted a fundraiser to help pay for her funeral costs on March 2, 2009. Held at the Firehouse Bar and Grill in Lomita, it was a fitting send-off in a place where she had many fond memories and made lifelong friends. For those whose lives Corey touched, the pain of her loss may never go away. 
Friends and family can console themselves with the knowledge that justice has been served. They can also cherish the memory of Corey Desmond, who even when she passed, remains alive in the hearts of those who knew and loved her. The world lost a great person. Somebody that was gonna be something, she was a great girl. She lived day by day uh, to the fullest. But she gave it her all. Whatever she did, she, she just gave it her all. And people love that about her. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.